Greetings. My name is Dr. Waddell Brooks, Sr., your host, and this is Community Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an outstanding program tonight. We have two exemplary people. We have um, uh, attorney, uh, state senator, uh, Ira I. Silverstein, uh, Illinois State Senate, 8th Senate District. He's a majority caucus whip, and he's a sponsor of Senate Bill 2151, which we will be promulgating information to you tonight. We also have Denise uh, Rothheimer. Uh, she's the founder and executive director of Mothers on a Mission to Stop Violence. And she's the author of uh, Senate Bill 2151 Amendment uh, Crime Victims Compensation Act. Greetings, folks. We're very happy that you've taken time literally from your busy schedule to be with us on Community Forum. And if you um, people don't know you um, all over the world, they will know you after this show. Because this show airs um, on uh, uh, Time Warner um, uh, Television in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Can TV, Chicago. Um, <coughs> and also it's online and people will see you all over the world, okay. Japan, Philippines, and Australia, and, and so forth. So, so this is the time for me to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it has happened before. You had a friend of yours, uh, co uh, uh, Senate, uh, uh, Senator B uh, Barack Obama? Correct. Yes. You worked with him, and so it... Barack, yeah, Barack and I served together for five or six years in the Illinois Senate. Okay. He okay. went up to greater things. So. If he can do it, he can, if he can do it from the Illinois Senate, anyone else, men and women, can do it. So don't don't give up. I right, won't. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Ira I. Silverstein uh, was first elected to the Illinois Senate in 1998. Uh, throughout his tenure representing the 8th Senate District, he has been an advocate for good government and a strong voice for making communities safer, enforcing victims' rights, and protecting consumer rights. Senator Silverstein was singled out in the past by a Sh Chicago Tribune editorial as being a quiet but hardworking legislator and one of the few members who actually reads all proposed legislation. <laughs> this reputation helped Senator Silverstein achieve the position of Majority Caucus Whip. Senator Silverstein is a leading voice for public safety, passing legislation protecting children from known sexual predators and from cyber bullies, quote unquote. He is a tireless promoter of consumer rights and victims' rights, as well as internet and technology related protections. He serves on the Senate's executive, financial institutions, executive appointments, insurance, and judiciary committees. Senator Silverstein earned his bachelor's degree from Loyola University, Chicago, and his law degree from John Marshall Law School. He is married to Deborah Silverstein, a CPA, and alderman of Chicago's 50th Ward. They have four children. Well, Denise, I've given the um, history of uh, Senator uh, Silverstein, uh, but you have been on this show quite a few times and uh, been a co-host, and so I'm going to let you give a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Dr. Brooks. I'm glad to be back, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to inform your viewers on important legislation that uh, Senator Silverstein has sponsored mm -hmm. in order to amend the Crime Victim Compensation Act and include legal representation as mm -hmm. a compensable expense so that victims can enforce their rights at no cost to them or additional cost to taxpayers. So that's uh, an issue that I find in my work, uh, reaching out to the community members, getting the phone calls, assisting the victims, guiding them through the process, and making sure that their uh, right to be treated with respect for their dignity is upheld. Denise, uh, you're a founder and executive director of a group called Mothers on a Mission to Stop Violence. And I mentioned that uh, in addition to the author of uh, the amendment to the Crimes uh, Victims' Compensation Act. 
But just to give a little snippet about uh, mothers um, uh, on a mission to stop violence. I actually founded Mothers on a Mission to Stop Violence because I was competing with other organizations. In 2003, I approached my state representative based on my experience through the criminal legal system when my daughter was raped at the age of 11 and I didn't realize how difficult it was in getting the right kind of support from a state representative to sponsor a bill. It's very important to have the right sponsor of your bill. Mm -hmm. uh, the bill that I initially had died in rules committee. Years went by. I wasn't informed of the process. So that was a whole area I had to learn. Mm -hmm. And I decided to just start this organization. I never did a 501c3 mm -hmm. or thought to try to get funding for it. I just wanted to get the goals accomplished. And as such, I've been able to successfully work to pass two state laws, mm -hmm. uh, both passed unanimously. And now having the right senator as the bill sponsor for Senate Bill 2151, I'm confident that this will also pass unanimously into law. You know, I probably didn't give all the, uh, <coughs> the great information about Senator Sivacine, but you are responsible uh, for the show tonight. You're the, you're the producer for the show tonight. So I'm going to let you uh, uh, introduce uh, Senator Silverstein. And he, since he's taken time from his very busy schedule to come down to uh, Waukegan to Community Forum to enlighten us about the bill. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. And also, he was in Springfield yesterday. Okay. Fortunately, they were not called into session today, which is why we're able to do the show and why you accommodated us. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just simply like to start out by making viewers aware of what it's like as an individual who does go down uh, to our state capitol to voice opposition or support on legislation. And that's actually how uh, Senator Silverstein came to know me and the genesis of our working relationship so he could actually begin to explain to the viewers what he had witnessed and what compelled him to reach out actually to me uh, for initiating what now has become Senate Bill 2151. Mm -hmm. uh, Denise is a good example of uh, people getting involved in politics and getting involved in the process. Um, her <coughs> getting two other bills passed to became law is outstanding. Mm -hmm. It can be done. It just takes a lot of hard work and uh, a lot of patience. Uh, so I commend her for doing that, and it's, I, I appreciate people that actually come down to Springfield. We get a lot of calls and emails, but actually coming down to Springfield, even though it's like a, a drive for individuals, it's good to meet with your legislators. We're all in one building or next door, so you get a good face-to-face -face contact. I was compelled by Denise's story, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what she went through, um, how the problem with the system. Um, that's why I took up the cause and I sponsored the bill. Uh, the bill basically says that if uh, men's the victim's crimes rights, that if you're a person, unfortunately, who is a victim of crime, can have an attorney represent them um, through the process. Um, we, at first, I think this is a bill that has caused a little excitement in Springfield. We were lucky enough to have a subject matter hearing, I think, a couple of months ago in October, where, um, which was the first step. I mean, people think of Springfield being dysfunctional, and it, unfortunately it is dysfunctional when it comes to the budget. But we do a lot of work in Springfield. There are a lot of good men and women who come there every week and try to get bills done. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the Senate is different than the House. Uh, obviously, once the bill is introduced, it's got to go to a committee, uh, passes a committee, then goes before the full Senate, and the same thing starts again in the House. And hopefully, if it gets out of the House, the governor will sign the bill. The first step was to get the bill introduced, get the language, which we did. And they have a subject matter hearing, which was something which I thought was very important because this is the type of bill that you have to educate the public about. It's a very sensitive bill, too, because not many people know about this issue and, God forbid, don't even want to hear about these issues. Mm -hmm. But we had a very thorough subject matter hearing, which I think Denise, Denise can talk about, uh, where uh, advocates came out pro and against, for and against this bill. Um, and then not many people are against the bill. They're concerned about the money problems, which everyone is concerned about in this state. But um, a lot of stories were told, um, heart-wrenching stories, uh, stories of people that have, uh, that I believe the system has let down. Mm. Um, you know, the criminal justice system right now is going through a, a very big change, especially in Chicago. And this is one area that I think we have to um, um, try to uh, improve. Uh, victims' rights are very important, even though there's 
provisions in the Illinois Constitution for that, and there, there's an act. But I think we have to go one step further. I mean, they can rely on the state's attorney's office, but they're not lawyers, and sometimes deals are made in back rooms, which never happens in Springfield. But um, I think that um, as, a, as an advocate for this, for this cause, Denise has really been, done a stellar job of educating not only myself but other uh, colleagues. And, you know, I, on the Senate floor, I'm, people come up to me, you know, Denise is calling me, can I get on the bill, can I get on the bill, where's the bill going? And we have bipartisan support. I'm a type of legislator that always works across the aisle. We have Senator Altoff, who is a co-sponsor of the bill, which I'm very pleased. And we have some more state senators, Dems and Republicans, who are interested in this bill. Because that's how it should be done in Springfield. Unfortunately, there's a lot of big eagles in Springfield. But in order to get things done, it's got to be through a bipartisan uh, mm -hmm. method. You just can't have a partisan method. People don't want to hear about it. And when it's bipartisan, people know it's a good bill on both sides of the aisle. So I, I kudos to her. I don't know if she wants to talk about the subject matter hearing, who showed up, but some of the stories I, I were, were heart-wrenching and sad, but yet I'm very motivated by this bill. Hopefully we can get this bill out of the Senate and over to the House and get it for the governor. I would think that probably would not be a problem with both houses getting bipartisan support for a bill such as this. Uh, maybe we should go in detail about the why is there a need for SB 2151. Well, I can start off by saying and piggyback on the Crime Victims' Rights Act okay. uh, that Senator Silverstein mentioned is part of our Illinois state constitution. Mm -hmm. And that was recently amended, I believe, in 2014. We had an amendment to the Victims' Bill of Rights. And in there was language that prohibits the court from appointing attorneys for victims of crime. Mm. So for me, um, I thought, well, that's a little unfair and discriminatory towards individuals who may not have funds to retain legal representation, which is a right in the state statute. It's known as the enabling legislation. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, the state of Illinois says you have a right to hire an attorney at your expense to represent you as though you are a named party. But then the state constitution, which trumps the state statute mm -hmm. uh, says the court, meaning the judge, no matter what your story or situation, is prohibited from appointing an attorney for you. Mm -hmm. So to remedy this flaw, um, the bill, Senate Bill 2151, accounts for monies that is already available in a fund called the Compensation Act, and it will allow for individuals uh, to be able to retain legal representation, which actually enforces a victim's right mm -hmm. at no cost to the, to the victim or additional cost to taxpayer because, as I said, we're using existing monies. Mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. adding to, uh, but it will allow victims the opportunity to say, well, I don't have a right to be informed of, you know, the plea deal that the prosecutor is negotiating. I want to be informed this is a right that I have. Uh, so then the victim can say, I want to be able to retain legal representation so that I can get that right enforced because it's important to know what is going to come up in court because at the sentencing, once the offender is sentenced or the defendant is sentenced, uh, you get to make a victim impact statement. And if you don't know this, making a victim impact statement is one of the rights you have to request. Mm -hmm. So if you don't even know you have that right, how are you going to request it? So it's important to have legal representation because a lawyer, an attorney, will actually be able to inform you because now you're a client of what your rights are and ensure that uh, all your rights are enforced. Uh, Senator, uh, tell us about uh, some challenging experiences that you had to, in, to get this bill uh, moving forward. Well, a lot of some people are against the bill, and one of the issues is the money issue. Um, how much is a lawyer going to charge? And, those are issues that we're still looking into, and looking into. The other part is a lot of people, a lot of state's attorneys may not like this bill because um, it maybe impedes on what they're doing. You know, mm. um, you know, you're stepping on their toes, having a third lawyer or third party looking at what they're doing. Um, basically, um, there was some opposition. Um, it, it's first when a bill is introduced, it's referred to the rules committee. Okay. Um, and in the rules committee, we were able to get a subject matter hearing, which is a very good start. Um, I think the problem with the bill is that it's just getting people informed 
um, telling that this is a good bill that you should really, if you find out who your legislator is, whether a House or a senator, call him or her up and say, look, I want to get on Bill 2151. Um, but so far, the opposition has only been with the monetary issue, that lawyers might be charging too much, which some, which some do, some don't. Um, you know, the, under this crime victim fund, they, people are compensated for certain losses, the psychological uh, um, uh, costs or anything that are physical costs or hospitalization. So they are, they are compensated for those things. But this takes it a step further. And, you know, as Denise rightly pointed out, there are a lot of rights that, unfortunately, victims do not know mm -hmm. they have. And maybe the state's attorney's office may, you know, the, the, given the volume of cases, they may not be able to communicate effectively, or the court may not be able to communicate effectively what those rights are. So having a third party in there just to help that in the victim, I think, is very important, especially, you know, they've suffered a tremendous, God forbid anyone should know from anything what Denise went through or anyone else has gone through. Uh, a terrible situation, and they're just trying to seek justice. And that's, that's how I look at this bill. We're just seeking justice. That's all we're doing. Um, and, you know, it's, some people might not like the way it's drafted. Uh, I'm always open to amendments and open up to um, suggestions. But, um, you know, the process starts in Springfield in February, and we'll see where the bill takes us. So uh, we'll, um, we'll just take it one step at a time. Okay, that's what I was, was going to, some listening owners maybe want to know, just about how long it takes for a bill to be processed? Good question. Depends on the bill. <laughs> if it's not controversial, it can fly out of both the House and the Senate within a week. Um, mm -hmm. uh, normally, like I said, when a bill like this is introduced, it goes to the Assignments Committee or the Rules Committee. That is a separate committee that assigns mm -hmm. it to mm -hmm. a, a, a substantive committee. This bill would probably go to Judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing is held there, and if it passes, if we have enough votes, uh, then we can get it out. That's why it's important that we keep it bipartisan so when it gets out of committee, uh, my colleagues see, and I always look how the committee voted, how many Republicans voted for it, how many Democrats vote for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a nice mix, it shows that the bill is a good bill. People like it. If you have one old Dems and no Republicans, that's, that's a sign that something is, you know, I don't like using the word not kosher or someone's got some opposition. So I suspect if it gets out of the Rules Assignment Committee, we have in the, in the Illinois Senate, it will go before the Judicial, Judiciary Committee. Uh, Denise will probably come down and testify again, um, and we're going to have to lobby the members on that committee. I said on that committee too, but um, you know, nothing, you can't predict anything. I've given up predicting everything in Springfield nowadays, um, since recent, recently. So if it gets out of the committee, it goes before the full Senate, and then we have to need 30 votes to get out of the Senate. Out of 59, mm -hmm. we need 30 votes to get out, mm -hmm. and that takes a lot of work because you have to you know, lobbyists or you know, or individuals have to go meet each individual senator getting a commitment from him and her. Um, you know, usually um, a good a good advocate will have a sheet with them telling them who's against it, who's it what, what the pros and cons are, um, and answering legislator questions. That's why it's good, you know, in this bill like this, to bring people down to Springfield to talk to legislators. Sometimes we're hard to reach in our Senate district. But um, I think basically um, it's going to take a lot of legwork. And if it gets out of the Senate, it starts the whole process again in the House. The House, you have 118 members, so you need 60 votes. So it's talking to 60 legislators. But by the time, if the bill gains enough momentum in the Senate, people in the House know what's going on. Um, and they'll, they'll find out what's going on, or they'll read about it in the paper. So I, I think, you know, it's a long, arduous process. It's, it's a process which sometimes I, I think should be streamlined. But the process does work, even though people don't like Springfield right now. Uh, the, the process does work. And it, this is a good example of how the process hopefully will work to everyone's benefit. For the benefit of our <coughs> listening audience, we're talking about Article 1, uh, Section 8.1 uh, of the Illinois Constitution. Correct. That's correct. Right. Now, it's my understanding that this is an amendment um, uh, to, the, uh, to the law? No. Um, the Victim's <coughs> Bill of Rights in the Illinois Constitution is its own act, its, its own okay. law. Okay. So there's uh, state legislation, state statutes that the state constitution trumps the state statute. Okay. But the state statute also serves as enabling legislation, so it helps make what's in the constitution come into reality, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. the, the people. The Compensation Act is its own piece okay. of legislation. It's the Crime Victims Compensation Act. Mm -hmm. Then you have the crime, the Rights of Crime Victims and Witnesses Act, which is the state statute that serves as the 
enabling legislation to the victims bill of rights mm -hmm. i really have to compliment you you've done a a lot of work and because you were personally involved um what about uh what you think this will cause more people to come forward now in in, in supporting you oh and and well i i have so much support i know mm -hmm. that once we get to the committee the judiciary committee it's going to be undeniable that this will pass unanimously. Okay. Uh, the, the points to be made, number one, we have a right to retain legal representation at our expense. My mm -hmm. child's been raped, but the state says, if I want to pay out of pocket to retain legal representation, mm -hmm. to hire an attorney to represent my child as though she's a named party, then I can exercise that right if I so choose. When I went through the criminal legal system in 2002-2003 and met with the actual prosecutor in Jasmine's case, I asked the prosecutor, can I hire an attorney? And the reason I asked is because the prosecutor asked me if I believed in second chances mm -hmm. and wanted to offer the man who raped my child mm -hmm. if I would be okay with him getting three years and no jail time so he can get therapy. And I said, well, rape, there are no second chances. Mm -hmm. Who are you, mm -hmm. you know, representing? And that's when I asked if I could get a lawyer for Jasmine. I was misinformed, not informed of any rights, and uh, ended up becoming railroaded, which is why I do the work I do. Um, it had been a lot cheaper for me to have just hired an attorney and paid out of pocket at mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't have had this victimization by the system, which is a, an area that um, traumatically is its own. You cannot describe what it's like to go through the criminal legal system and have somebody who sits in a uh, position of criminal justice authority uh, actually further victimize you. It, it, it's incomprehensible, and, and I don't want other people experiencing further trauma, a second injury, so to speak, because the rape of our children, the murder of our loved ones is more, more than any one of us should ever have to bear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Senator, legal representation, and so we're talking about, it benefits crime victims and the state. You know, you may address that, but you mentioned that legislators only look at, uh, at the money dollar signs. That's one of the <laughs> oppositions to it is how much is the fund only has a certain amount of money which is used for other things other than attorney's fees. So a lot of a lot of my colleagues says well maybe we should cap the attorney's fees at a certain amount uh, to keep a handle on this. I mean that's something that Denise objects to. Um, mm. I, I, I have not heard any um, discussions yet, yet on that issue. But um, it's definitely a monetary issue right now of how much money is in the fund and how many how many lawyers are going to be needed and how, how much how many people are going to take advantage of it too that's another issue we don't know how many people are going to be taking advantage of it um, I mean some of the stories that were told at the subject matter hearing I don't know if you want to talk about them it were, were very heart-wrenching and were compelling for the bill right and, and that's why I say what we've experienced we've had parents uh, whose children were murdered we had parents whose children were raped we had individuals who were raped themselves mm -hmm. uh, victims of domestic violence yeah. And, you know, the, the trauma of just going through that victimization by a criminal offender is one um, impact that you, you have to deal with. Then when you are coupled with the injustice of the system, the very system that is supposed to be there to guide you and support you and do what's right and, uh, you well, know. Well, I, 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 I'll take... <laughs> As an attorney, I do believe in, I don't do any criminal law, I do a lot of civil litigation, mm -hmm. but this, I, I believe in the system, um, mm -hmm. so I, mean, I have to disagree with you, and um, even though the system might be flawed, the system does work, uh, and uh, so I know you, we, you and I are different in that aspect about the injustice, but um, you know, you're, you're trying to correct a wrong here, but overall the system, I believe, works fairly well. Um, you might not like it. But I think, uh, you know, prosecutors have a tremendous challenge against them when they prosecute maybe 30 or 40 cases a day. Um, but I think they do a good job, and, you know, defense lawyers do what they can to represent their client. That's what they're being paid for, and that's what their duty is. 
But in this situation, um, I, and I don't want to deviate from what you're saying, is that uh, these individuals who have been, who have been victimized um, maybe are not telling all their rights like you weren't told. And I think that's unfortunate. It's something that we need to correct. And if it's meaning hiring a lawyer um, to help that individual get through the sentencing proceeding or something like that, I think that I think it's important. But uh, the system does work, Denise. So, uh, okay, and let I, me just okay. rebut. Okay. Um, I appreciate your <coughs> sentence. Um, I in no way at no time ever said the system doesn't work, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, when you have a prosecutor telling you as a mother, um, when I asked, why didn't you tell me that you agreed to a plea deal? I had to learn from the defense attorney that uh, the state agreed to a plea deal for a minimum of six years. So when I said to her, why did you agree to the plea deal, and she responds to me, you're not a lawyer, I don't have to explain the law to you, does not mean the system works. What I am saying is that we have individuals who are yeah. part of the system. And you cannot say that anyone who is a part of an institution is going to be 100% pure and 100% ethical. There is going to be human error. It may be uh, malicious and with intent or willful. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that when we do encounter these individuals who are human beings and are responsible personally for their actions, which should not be a reflection on the institution of justice or the profession, uh, we need to be able to have some type of an ability, action, to hold them accountable, to be able to remedy the flaw, the injustice that we experience. Now, we were not told about this right to make a victim impact statement. When I did disagree with the plea deal, the judge heard me, and that was because the bailiff, at my direction, informed the judge that I disagreed, not the prosecutor. Um, so I had a very decent human being with high level of ethics going to the judge on my behalf to let the judge know I disagreed. And because of that, what happened is the judge refused the plea deal. So the plea deal in of itself by this prosecutor who has 30 or so cases is completely irrelevant because she made an inappropriate plea deal violating our rights, not informing us, to which the judge rejected. Um, we should not have to encounter this type of controversy or uh, confrontation with individuals who are supposed to be there to advocate on our behalf. They're not our representative as far as legal representation. They're not our attorney, but they are there to serve as an advocate. It's not an advocate when you tell somebody, I don't need to explain the law to you. You're not an attorney. You don't say that to a mother whose child's been raped. It's hard enough for 11-year-old or 12-year-old children who've been raped to be able to even come forward. What you want to do is you want to provide support. You want to provide guidance. And by enabling victims to retain legal representation, we're just going to ensure that they're treated with respect for their dignity throughout the entire process in case there are these particular individuals that may come up that I experienced, like many of the others who testified at the, su the subject matter hearing uh, experienced. When these experiences happen, we need a remedy. And that's what Senate Bill 2151 does. It's not to say the system doesn't work. Of well, what, what happened to you is unfortunate and unconscionable. I mean, just to hear it again. And it doesn't just happen to me. And in fact, there's another statute uh, that I would like to mention, and it's mm -hmm. called uh, the Victim Assistance Witness Act. Mm -hmm. And what that act says, it, it says the legislature, the General Assembly, finds that crime, when crime strikes, crime victims are often ignored mm -hmm. and put at risk of further victimization by this system. So it's already been a finding by the General Assembly that victims are further victimized by the system, yet there's been no real work done in legislation to ensure that victims have a right to enforce the law. We go through the legal system, but yet we're given advocates. Advocates have no voice in the legal system. Only attorneys can represent an individual. Only attorneys can give legal advice. So when you are going through a legal process without legal representation, 
you are put at risk <clears throat> of becoming further victimized by that very system. So that is, again, what Senate Bill 2151 remedies. So, Senator... Hard act to follow. <clears throat> right, but have you been convinced that there is a need for 2151? I think there's definitely a need for it. I think that uh, after hearing the, um, Denise's uh, uh, story and hearing other people, the subject matter hearing, I think there is a, there is some need. I, I, the more protection we give to victims, are, is, it makes the system stronger. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more protection we give to people to know their rights is something which uh, we, uh, we we live in a process of due process. I think it's important. So I, I do think there's a need. I mean, uh, I, and maybe, and like I said. People might, prosecutors might not like it because you have a, another pair of eyes look over, looking over the prosecutor's uh, or shoulder. But I think it's important that these people who have been through, God forbid, even think about what the people have gone through, these traumatic uh, crimes, um, make sure that they get some, uh, I, I don't know if the word is closure, but some relief or comfort that the system is working for them. Mm -hmm. So I, I do believe that there is a need for this. Um, I'm, I'm hopefully that. You can see how passionate Denise is in this area, and she's very passionate. Um, and she, everyone that she has got, she I've spoken to who knows Denise, gives me the, tells me the same story how they've been, you know, that, that system has let them down. So I think there's definitely a need for this. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's something that we're going to have to, you know, maybe do a little battling in Springfield. But the more rights, the more information a victim has, the the more important it is for the system, so they can get some closure and move on even well, though it's very difficult. Well, what does she, Denise, has to do, get more people to come with the, talk with the committees that are well, I, and so I, forth? Well, if to anyone out there who <coughs> likes this bill, uh, you can contact me in my Senate office. Uh, my number is 773-743-5015, which will be more than happy to give you the information. Or tell us where you live, and we'll tell you what legislator to contact. Mm -hmm. uh, the more awareness, you know, the, you know, the, the way I, most legislators operate is that we get hundreds of bills. We had over six or seven hundred bills filed last year. Only 230 became law. If there's a heater, so to speak, or if I'm getting calls on a certain bill, I'm going to wake up and say, hey, you know, what's going on with this bill? So the more people contact their legislator to say, hey, look, this is a bill that you know may never affect me, God forbid, or any of my family, but it's an important issue, a very social, moral issue. That's what's important. That's what people have to do to start contacting the legislators to make her job a little easier. But the more phone calls people make, the more emails, um, faxes, whatever you do, um, that's, that, that's what people need to do. I mean, the, the process does work, even though, like I said, Springfield can be dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. When legislators will get up 10, 30, 50 calls, they'll say, hey, what's going on over here? I mean, there's only so many. We read every bill, or I try to read every bill. Uh, it's getting a little bit luminous lately since the amount of bills. Uh, but uh, we, we do what we do our best. But the more awareness people have on this bill and this issue, which I think is important, the more much more easier for myself and Denise to get this through the General Assembly. I mention this because um, I, I mentioned before, too, that legal rep representation benefits the crime victims and the state, right? It, 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 yeah, I think, I think it, it, it gives more confidence in the system and in the state. Yeah, it does. I think it does both. It totally does both. Mm -hmm. And I can put into example how that happens. Okay. Um, for example, when I was able to object to the plea deal mm -hmm. for the minimum six years, mm -hmm. you would have had an individual who uh, was not sentenced appropriately. You have to realize that there is a precedent set in court. And when you start lowering the bar, Mm -hmm. In certain regards, I remember working on Jasmine's Law, which is the first law that actually passed mm -hmm. uh, into law. Um, I remember the Senate sponsor, uh, Michael Bond, at that time, told me, Denise, how are we going to increase sentencing for the rape of children when the sentencing for murderers isn't even th that high, like 12 years? And I'm like, well, how is it my fault? <laughs> are my problem mm -hmm. that murderers are getting you know six years or 12 years I mean the the sentencing you have to realize too and I'm glad we're going to be having the state's attorney uh, in the next program as a follow-up to this show mm -hmm. because there's a reality of 93 percent of these cases result in plea deals mm -hmm. 
Mm. What you have to realize a plea deal is, <clears throat> is it's a negotiation between the state and the defendant. Mm -hmm. The victim isn't okay. always involved in that conversation. So you want to ensure that uh, there is a proper voice. And one thing a lot of people don't know, and even our legislators are might be unaware of is that the American Bar Association, because again, we're talking about the legal system, legal rights, the legal mm -hmm. process. So the American Bar Association had a finding that 70% of judges feel that victim impact statements uh, lead them to make uh, appropriate sen sentencing and fair restitution. Mm -hmm. So this is very important and critical to state matters, to resolve state matters, that judges have the right information factually based so that they can make the best possible decisions to have the kind of outcomes that we want to see set as precedent for our community. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know our listening audience is thinking the legislators and the judges and the state's attorneys, all, they have wives, children, and so forth that uh, may be attacked and be under the same circumstances, you know. And would they have a different feeling, a different approach, <laughs> you know, uh, to the bid, bill or amendment if it happens to them? Well, I'm sure you, <laughs> you made a good point. Yeah, I'm sure they would. I mean, everyone takes things very personally in their own lives when a leg piece of legislation is, is presented before the Illinois General Assembly. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I just think that, um, you know, these plea deals, which Denise talked about, mm -hmm. um, are done in between the state's attorney and the defense attorney. Um, and um, I think the victim should have some rights. I don't know. How many, I mean, that's a, probably a point of contention, like a lot of state's attorney's office. Certainly, state's attorneys might disagree with me. Should have some impact in what, what the plea deal is going to be. Um, they're the one that's, you know, unfortunately, they're the one that, you know, the, the, vic the, 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 the predator or the criminal is maybe taken to jail and for months or years, but the victim leaves the courthouse um, scarred mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. needs some closure, and it takes a long time for someone like this to get their, um, to, to really become themselves again. So I think it's, it's important that they have some input. Maybe that's one part of the healing process, or one part of the closure process, so they can feel that the system has failed it. I think what Denise is showing is that in her mind, and the system has failed, failed her, if it wasn't for her sticking up for her rights, and um, you know we give her credit for something like that because that's that's how I give advocacy is done in the state. And it happens mm -hmm. to many others, and it is a right that we do have uh, to be informed of plea deals. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the problem is, Dr. Brooks, when you have a law, the state statute that is set in place to provide procedures. Remember, these are procedures, and if the state's attorney's office, there's an entire section in there uh, that talks about what the requirements of the state's attorney's office is, mm -hmm. what they're supposed to do. When they do not follow the law, mm -hmm. when our rights mm -hmm. are violated and these procedures are not being complied with, the victims are further victimized by the system and the end of the statute, there's a scope of the act and it says that we have no cause of action against the very individuals who are given this set of procedures in order to ensure compliance and enforcement of the law. So when we cannot hold them accountable or liable and there's no slap on the hand when they violate this law, mm -hmm. how often and how serious are they going to be in actually following the law? Yeah. So that's why having an attorney is important because at least there's some accountability factor when a victim's right is violated. Then they don't have to now deal with trying to confront uh, the, the prosecutor, let's say, who might be in violation or maybe law enforcement officer. They can have an attorney do it and they could step outside and then focus on their own healing. We should not have to engage in two battles, but some of us do. Mm -hmm. And I want to eliminate that unnecessary battle of having to try and defend yourself against the very system that is there to protect us. And I want our legislator to be able to enact the law 
that will help make sure that the system is there for the people to ensure justice for all, not just some, not just only those who can afford legal representation, because it is a right, and state's attorneys already have to deal with the fact that we can bring in another set of eyeballs, but our attorneys are not there to oversee the case against the defendant. Our attorneys are only and strictly there to ensure the enforcement of our rights to make sure that whatever our senators and state reps are doing in Springfield, mm -hmm. that it is coming into reality in play so that the people can have the trust and know that the system does work. This just ensures compliance. It's also, it's also another check. I mean, that's what, that's what you, I can say. It's another check on the system. That's, that's what it does. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Senator, how confident uh, you are that uh, this uh, amendment will come out of committee? I, I, I've stopped predicting on uh, Springfield, so I, 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 you know, we'll do our best. Uh, we've, we've made some headway because we had actually, at least we had a subject matter hearing. Now it's getting it out of the committee to the committee. Okay. Uh, I'll give it 100 percent, but I, I can't predict anymore. Like I said, I've given up. I, I lost Powerball last night, so I'm giving up. Um, <laughs> I'm giving up predicting. Believe me. So, uh, but um, the more people hear about this bill and the more people start engaging their legislators and like I said I, I stress cannot stress how important it is to get in contact with your individual legislator whether state senator or uh, or, uh, or legislator let state rep the more that, that would help us out tremendously because mm -hmm. the momentum it has to start moving mm -hmm. it's like a snowball you got to keep it rolling well I'm very happy to, to put special emphasis on this uh, on this amendment and, and, and I congratulate you. You were willing to appear at Skype. A lot of people have a Skype. And so I'm happy that things worked out. We could be here in person uh, to let our audience know that uh, you support this effort. Yes, I'm glad that um, I'm, not, I'm glad everything worked out. You know, there's a Yiddish say, saying, man plans and God laughs. So but we, have, we, we made it. We made it. We're able to make it. Yeah. Now tell us how many only. The process again. You want to go through this? How many on your on a committee? To well, like I said, it's gonna. It will go before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, then we'll have a hearing there. Uh, after it gets out of the Senate Judiciary Committee, it needs to get out by a majority of the votes. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that we get a bipartisan roll call, which Denise and I will have to work on. Um, it goes before the whole Senate, and that's that's my that's my job because I present the bill. I'm the one that has to argue the bill in the Senate, answer all the questions. Um, hopefully we'll have a nice roll call that we can get out with 30 votes. And then it goes, the whole system starts in the House. We have to get a sponsor in the House to pick it up and uh, make sure it doesn't get railroaded or something that doesn't get lost somewhere. So it, it is a hard mountain to climb. I'm not going to lie to you, mm -hmm. um, but it, it can be done. But the more public pressure, the more public opinion people give, more people participate, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. We all have faith in our system, and you said there were 59 uh, sen senators, yes, senatorial districts, and yeah, there's 59 state legislators and state senators, and 118 state legislators, the state reps. So uh, it's getting that magic number 30 in the Senate and 60 in the House. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but it just takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, Denise is fighting this 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 battle by herself, so to speak. Uh, she's not hiring any high power lobbyists. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how mm -hmm. things are done in Springfield. If you want to build on. I hire a high power lobbyist or several high power lobbyists. This is a grassroots effort, um, and it's it's a, it's a good effort. It's a moral issue. It's a social issue. Uh, no one's benefiting from financially out of this or economically. Yeah, yeah. It's just doing what's right. That's that's exactly how I look at it. That's why I picked up this cause. Uh, um, you know, being a legislator is, is is an honor, but it's it's also a privilege. And you know, God put me in this position to do good things for people, and that's that's how I look at my job. And another position you're in is uh, where's with the um, uh, majority um, uh, caucus whip. Yeah, it's, it's, I, 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 I control. I, I, when the Senate Dems caucus, I'm the one that runs the meeting. Okay. It could be very high, uh, highly contentious because you have 39 individuals who have their own opinions. So it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty tough job at times keeping order. I use the gavel a lot. Sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't. They don't listen to me at home, so why should they listen to me in caucus? So uh, it's just, um, it's just you know, it, it's it's a good job. I love it. Um, I mean, sometimes the the Eagles right now in Springfield are getting a lot out of hand right now. We 
we have too much info, partisan fighting right now. Mm. I think mean, people are getting fed up with it. A lot of legislators are getting fed up with it. Uh, but um, you know, we, we went yeah. first time in a year that we never have a budget. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a budget next year. Um, agencies that deal with crime victim rights have been severely handicapped because we haven't had a budget. The elderly and senior citizens have been handicapped because we haven't had a budget. There's no funding. And if there is funding, there's late payments. Uh, the state is not in good shape financially. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, Springfield at times can be very stressful. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, but we try to do what the, whatever we can for the good of the people. Now, um, uh, the the budget, the, this amendment here wouldn't affect the budget a great deal, would it? Because there's because no, of, there's funds already there. The funds are already there. Yeah. Right. So what, 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 it would have no financial impact. Um, I the only impact is going to be is uh, how much money should a, and if an attorney is appointed, how much he or she should be charging. Whether we should cap it because we don't, I don't even know myself how many of these cases are going to be, uh, people are going to be using lawyers. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, people may not know about it or people might not want to take advantage or people just don't want to, don't want to deal with it. Um, the victim of crime, they don't want to deal with sentencing or, or being actively involved as Denise was. So it, it's going to be a case by case ba basis to see mm -hmm. how, this mm -hmm. how this works. Well, I would like for you to put special emphasis on the importance of. SB 2151. You're the majority caucus whip, and you are the head of the committee. But if you were to tell our audience how important that this bill, to get this bill amendment passed, well, I, like I said before, what it means to them. I, I think this is important because a lot of us have never. Felt or God forbid should have dealt with situations where a, a child or individual is victimized, mm -hmm. and you want to protect their child or before protect that individual, but you also want to make sure that the person who did this harm to your loved one um, is you know is punished properly. Uh, you want to be part of that process because it's part of the healing process, I believe. Um, a process that you, you want to be you don't want to be excluded. Mm -hmm. And I think what Denise is showing you through the cases I've seen that a lot of people may be excluded. Um, deals are done which people might not want to deal with or, or like. So I think it's, it's, it's a, it really goes to the heart of, the I think, the criminal justice system that even though we, we believe in uh, rehabilitation and um, rehabilitating individuals so they can go back on the street and get a job and move forward in their lives, you know, you want to make sure the victims also have their same rights. The victims can move on with their lives. So that's why I think it's important that this bill get out of the Senate and in the House. I don't know what the governor's position is on this. That's, that's, that's another, another hurdle. Mm -hmm. But I just think that it's important that individuals really look at this bill and go online to the Illinois General Assembly and read the bill. You can call my office again at 773-743-5015. And I'll be more than happy to send you an email, a copy of the bill. Or if you want to call your legislators, I'll be more than happy to assist to find out who your legislator is. To let them, he or she, know that you think it's a good bill, it's supportive of this bill, uh, and remind them of the bill, Senate Bill 2151. So that's how the process works, and it's a grassroots project, process, process. Like I said, no, you know, normally when someone wants to get a bill passed in Springfield, they hire the, like I said before, the high power lobbyist groups. Mm -hmm. We all know who they are, mm -hmm. uh, the big law firms. Uh, this is just been by one young lady here and a group that stands behind her, and I think it's very, you know, commendable for what she's doing. And I think she's done a great job so far, and hopefully we can bring this home. This yeah. is fantastic. Uh, I'm very happy, uh, again, uh, that you really taken time to come down My to pleasure. the community forum to uh, promulgate this to our listening audience, which is about 100,000 people here in uh, Comcast uh, viewing audience. But like I say, it will be uh, aired all over. So maybe I should announce my candidacy for governor then. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Well, Brooks, if I could just throw in real quickly. Yeah, you have to have equal time. Exactly. <laughs> it's all about equal justice here. Um, but I, I want to mention that with all the talk about money mm, on, okay. in the fund, we have to realize that uh, $5 million went unspent in September of 2015. So right around the time we held the subject matter hearing on September 27th, uh, Five million dollars from the Crime Victim Compensation Fund went unspent, so it expired. That means five million dollars that could have gone to funeral expenses, therapy, medical, emergencies, housing, uh, 
money that could reimburse uh, lost wages for victims having to go to court and through trials, and then if your loved one was murdered and you have a child, then mm -hmm. if, if grandma has to raise the grandchild, then grandma can get like $1,250 a month. So all that money, $5 million, went unspent. So I don't even want to hear about the argument that uh, mm -hmm. we're not sure how much lawyers are going to want or how much is going to be spent. Then we have $6.2 million expiring this year in 2016. So just from last year and this year, we have $11.2 million going unspent. It mm -hmm. is unacceptable. The reason being is because people are not being informed of their rights to victim compensation, which is the second law that I authored and worked to pass into law. So it mm -hmm. is a law. Within 48 hours of a victim reporting a crime to law enforcement, they are supposed to receive information and an explanation of their rights and compensation. And I pr intentionally put in compensation because I know from my work with the people uh, that they are not being informed of this. So that is why we're having $11.2 million expire in funding because there's a 60% match by the federal government that's going unspent. Mm -hmm. These are very important dollars that are critical in the the provision in the introduction of the Victim Compensation Act is so that victims can recover and rebuild their lives from the criminal offense. So our opportunity to recover and rebuild from this heinous offense that, that was committed against us is going, it's expiring. Who is standing up and speaking out and saying this is unacceptable? Well, that's where Senator Ira Silverstein and I come in. When the law is not followed, people are not informed and they're not provided resources and they are not being treated with the number one right of being treated with respect for their dignity. It is undignifying to have this money go unspent and expire. Now, to enlarge upon this, because people uninformed are not applying for the well, if you don't know that it's yeah. there, how can you apply? Yeah, yeah. So what, what marketing has been done, Senator? I don't know if there's any marketing we can do. I mean, it's just getting people, unfortunately, not knowing their rights, and they're not being informed either right now by the court, the state's attorney's office. I mean, that's, that's a big issue. It's another, it's another issue we have to tackle. We but do. they get funded, and I don't mean to uh, disrespect by interjecting. Mm -hmm. You've got to realize that one law that I talked about, the Victim Assistance Act, that says we are further victimized by the system, that act was specifically put into place to provide funding for advocates. So the victim advocates, those who are with the rape agencies or domestic violence agencies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or even within the state's attorney's office who serve as child advocates, we have the Child Advocacy Center, then we have victim witness assistance, mm -hmm. um, they are getting funding to ensure the compliance and enforcement of our rights and that we are being informed. So when this is not being done, there's no compliance and it's as I said earlier, there's no slap on the wrist. What harm is it to, um, you know, to make people inform others that you have this right? It, it is a job that they do have to do, but they're being funded to do it. But when they're not delivering, it's actually the victim who loses out, and, and I just say that that's unacceptable, and they need to know that this money is there for them, and the resources are available. Well, let's highlight your daughter now. Then you tell me she um, has a challenging uh, job now? She's, well, a, she's an attorney? My daughter, uh, she, as I mentioned, was 11 years old. She disclosed a year later, and when she was 12, we went to the police department. We went through everything. I told Jasmine, you know, by the time we got done, because she was completely cut out, our case from the time of reporting to law enforcement mm -hmm. to sentencing and conviction was six months. It was so extremely fast. Uh, we were just in and out like the turnstile. But I want to make sure that our listening audience know what she's doing now. So I told her not to worry mm -hmm. um, that I was going to, you know, ensure that just because she didn't get justice, there would be justice out of the situation. So mm -hmm. she focused on her education. Okay. I gave her everything she needed, all the tools. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it became her ambition and desire to become this academic scholar because she was in special education classes having been uh, diagnosed in kindergarten with uh, emotional behavioral disorder, learning disability. Mm. She didn't want to feel like she was different from her peers. I uh, taught her the, you know, the values of Christ and uh, through him all things are possible. She ended up on a roll, uh, got 4.3 GPA in high school, well, and then she graduated uh, Washington and Lee with her undergrad, uh, summa cum laude, which is the highest honors, mm -hmm. and then she went to University of Cambridge Law School graduated uh, two years instead of three, did accelerated program. So now she yeah. resides in London, England, uh, where she has a law contract with one of the top five law firms in the world. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Senator Silverstein, I think I mentioned that you you want to highlight your wife, but yeah. what is she, how is she involved? Now? My wife's a Chicago alderman from the 50th Ward. So. Okay, so you have a lot of, uh, uh, Politics to talk in the, in the home. Yes, it's, there's a lot of politics in the home sometimes. <laughs> what about children? You got children? I have four children. They're all in school. So okay, okay. They're all in school working hard. That's why I'm working five, six days a week. Keep, Poli keep, poli keep, politically keep, involved? Or? No, somewhat, but mostly in school. Yeah. Trying to do their own academics. Well, I, I want to thank you very much. Uh, the time is winding down, and I want to get into in the, the nitty gritty, the um, Crime Victims Compensation Act, but I want to get a little bit of your your uh, highlights of what you're doing. In in addition, Mothers on a Mission to Stop Violence. That's a that's another uh, activity that keeps you busy too. Right? Yeah, and it's one where I, like I said, it's out of pocket. I've never applied for funding. I don't do this as a business. I get calls from real people um, who go through. They when they reach me, they've already hit the the brick wall, the dead end. I get them at their absolute worst when they've been not only victimized by the offender, but then by law enforcement or prosecutor, somebody in the system of authority. So I have to work really hard and really fast to be able to remedy whatever violation, build their esteem, get them in a position where they can begin to think positive, take action themselves, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. let them know there is a support system out here ready and willing to work with them so that they can ensure uh, justice for their child or their loved one or even themselves. I don't want anyone to despair. I don't want any child to lose their potential. I want everybody to know that, you know, there is justice for all of us. I want to thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We've been talking with Senator uh, Ira I. Silverstein, uh, Illinois State Senator from the 8th Senate District, Majority Caucus Whip, uh, sponsor of Bill. Hey.